Okay, that's good. Good evening and happy spring, Terps and guests. My name is Julie Scable, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Prince George's County Alumni Association. We're excited that you're able to join us for today's program, Return of the Periodical Cicadas, Fear, Fascination, and Fun in 2021. If you weren't around 17 years ago for the last Return of the Cicadas, prepare to be amazed this spring. And if you were around 17 years ago, you know how amazing this event is. Regardless, this program aims to provide you with an understand, a greater understanding of cicadas and this unique and totally awesome event. And I also think we'll get some bonus points for, for all the Zoom conferences we'll be on this spring as we're actually able to talk about this in an educated and knowledgeable way. Our speaker today is Mike Rao. Ralph, Mike is one of the University of Maryland's own. He is a professor emeritus and a fellow of the Entomology, Entomological Society of America. He's authored over 250 scientific and lay publications and delivered over 1,300 present presentations. He's a regular guest on NPR and has been featured on National Geographic and the Science Channel. He's appeared with Jay Leno, Dr. Oz, Hoda Kotoba, and others. Recently has been on the Today Show, WTOP, and other media outlets as the interest in the 17-year cicada, cicadas is growing. His Bug of the Week website and YouTube channel reach thousands of viewers across the globe on a weekly basis. His most recent book, 26 Things That Bug Me, introduces children to the wonder of insects and natural history. His book, Managing Insects and Mites on Woody Landscape Plants, is the standard for the a boricultural industry. Please give a round of virtual applause to Mike Rout. If you have questions, comments, or shout outs during the event, please put them in the chat box, which we'll be monitoring throughout tonight's evening, this evening's program. With this, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Mike. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Julie, for that uh, very glowing introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening, folks. Thank you so much. Uh, Alumni Association for putting this thing together and uh, for letting me in all your homes uh, this evening. And uh, I see some very interesting backgrounds, which is something I always love to see. I'm still looking for my first cat. And of course, I nice want to be able to actually hear it. I will hear it, will I? Okay, that's good. And I, of course, have to say uh, good evening to my. Oh my esteemed colleagues, uh, Leslie Pick and Marcia Schaufner. I'm not sure in the thumbnails uh, who else might be peeking in tonight, but nonetheless, it's great to be here. And hey, gang, I'm an alum too, class of 1982, before many of you were born. Okay, so let's dig in. I'm going to, do we have the screen share up? I think we do already, yeah? Yep, yep, looks good. good. To go. mm -hmm. Okay, with that, let's roll it and see what we can learn about the periodical cicada. I wanna take a little bit of a historical perspective on this this evening. So let's go back uh, to the early colonial days when we got our first glimpse or the folks from uh, our ancestors from Europe got the first glimpse of periodical cicadas. 
William Bradford, the second governor of the Massachusetts colony wrote this. All the month of May, there was such a quantity of great sort of flies, like for bigness to wasps or bumblebees, which came out of holes in the ground and ate green things and made such a constant yelling noise as made all the woods ring of them and ready to deaf the hearers. Well, you know how governors are, they're prone to hyperbole and obviously Bradford was no exception. So I dug a little deeper and in 19, excuse me, 1666, I read the first published account about periodical cicadas in the New World in the Royal uh, Society, the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London. Here's what Henry Oldenburg had to say. A great observer who hath lived long in New England did upon occasion relate to a friend of his in London, where he lightly was that some few years since there was such a swarm of a certain sort of insects in that English colony that for the space of 200 miles, they poisoned and destroyed all the trees in that country, there being found innumerable little holes in the ground out of which those insects broke forth in the form of maggots, which turned into flies and had a tail or sting, which they struck into the tree and thereby envenomed and killed it. Oh my, it's not gonna be that bad gang, I promise. It won't be that bad. The first account here in Maryland came from um, St. Mary's County, the first colonial capital of Maryland. And this was actually a very unique brood. It's called brood 19. It's one of the 13 year cicadas. The anonymous uh, author of this in 1751 placed this in the Maryland Gazette. We are informed in some places, the locusts have been found in great plenty just under the surface of the earth, almost at their full growth. May God avert our impending calamities. So these guys were worried, feature this, they had just escaped religious persecution in the old world. They came to America and all of a sudden you have billions of these things coming up out of the ground. They said, OMG, we're back in Egypt. This is the eighth plague. We've made a mistake here. Well, not really that bad. Now, Kara, this one's for you. A lot of people think that cicadas are locusts and this is uh dating back to this one of these early accounts it it turns up that locusts became associated with cicadas cicadas are not locusts locusts are grasshoppers okay there are certain species of locusts in places like sub-saharan africa and parts of asia that basically become gregarious they then take flight and they eat everything in their path these are the biblical locusts cicadas on the other hand well you know they're more like laurel and hardy of the insect world these are much more closely related to aphids they have a kind of sucking mouth part that they put into the plant and sit plant sap Locusts, on the other hand, have chewing mouth parts and they can really destroy anything in their path. Now, a question I always get is, what is the big deal? Don't we see cicadas every year? Well, sure we do. The cicadas we see every year are called annual cicadas or dog day cicadas. We usually see these rascals in the dog days. June, July, August, September, October, maybe on a long stretch. These ones are gonna take two to eight years to develop underground, but every year we're going to see some of the annual cicadas. Now their strategy for survival is what I call stealth and speed. They have banding patterns that help them blend in. They tend to be green in color, so they blend in with the foliage that they feed on up in the treetops. And they fly very rapidly. They fly like uh, F-16, so they can really take, take off quickly. It's very hard to capture these creatures. Periodical cicadas, on the other hand, are either underground for 13 or 17 years. That's how long it takes the nymphs to develop. 
they're going to emerge in massive numbers. And when I say massive, I mean massive. There can be as many as 1.5 million cicadas per acre. They're going to appear early. We're going to start to see these guys probably in the waning days of April. The populations will begin to build for the first two weeks in a crescendo. And by the last two weeks of May and the first week of June, hey, that's when the big party up in the treetop is going to take place. Towards the end of June, they'll begin to tail off and then they'll be gone for another 17 years. They have bright red eyes, black bodies, and beautiful orange wings. And their survival strategy is one of the most bizarre of any creature in the animal world. It is called predator satiation, safety in numbers. And what that means is they are going to emerge in such massive numbers that they will fill the bellies of every predator that wants to eat them. And there'll still be enough left over to perpetuate the three species that will be emerging this year. Boom. That's kind of crazy. Now, there are three species of 17-year cicadas, and we can differentiate these by their size, by the color patterns, by their songs or their calls, and by their habitat preferences, and of course, by their nuclear and mitochondrial genetic markers. So let's listen to some of the songs. Let me, I'm going to tinker with sound here for just a second. Bear with me. There we go. Let's make it a little bit better, I believe. That's Septemdecim. This is the most common species. This one's my favorite, the Cassinis. And finally, the rarest of the three species, the Septendeculus. They sound a little bit like crickets or katydids, I think. There are also four species of 13-year periodical cicadas, and they too can be differentiated by their size, their color patterns, their habitat preferences, and of course, the genetic markers. What is a brood? We've called this brood brood 10, or to make it even more mysterious, we love to call it brood X, as in X marks the spot, or X files, or extra special. So, the early cicada scientists decided that they would keep track of these using Roman numerals. So brood X is really brood 10. So there are 17 broods, uh, theoretical broods of the 17-year cicadas. And they originally thought there could be an additional 13 broods of the 13-year cicadas. Unfortunately, all we know is three broods of the 13-year cicadas, and we only have 12 broods of the 17-year cicadas, making a total of 15 broods. Now, what we do know is that in recorded history, two of the broods have gone extinct. Brood 11, up here in Connecticut, is no longer with us, and brood 21 down in Florida has been extirpated. We've also had basically disappearance or extirpation of local populations up down the East Coast uh, in recorded history. Here in Maryland, we're fortunate to have five different broods that we can enjoy uh, during, the, uh, during the several years that they emerge. Now, this particular brood is called the Big Brood or the Great Northern Brood. It will occur in 15 states ranging from northern Georgia and Tennessee, parts of Kentucky, up to Maryland and as far north as Long Island. They will also have a big population in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. However, 
You can't really see it very clearly on this map because of all the other dots. But this is what I like to call the epicenter. The cicada densities here will be heroic. And what you will have is the intersection of billions, perhaps trillions of cicadas with 30 million human beings that live in me major metropolitan areas along the East Coast. So this is really gonna be something special. To look a little bit more closely about the distributions, here are those three pockets I talked about. And this will be the distribution in Northern Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia. This will trail off up into New Jersey, heading for New York. Let's talk a little bit about how we got these uh, 15 extant broods. In other words, the ones that are here right now. We know that somewhere about, <clears throat> somewhere about 4 million years ago, that the ancestors of the current cicadas split into two major groups or clades. The Cassinis and Decula went one way. The bigger cicadas, the ones we call decims, went the other way. At about 2.5 million years ago, the Deculas took their own trajectory and the Cassinis went their own trajectory. But it's only been within the last 500,000 years that those 15 extant broods have radiated and basically spread throughout our country. A very recent evolution. Now, the actual genetic mechanisms causing the 17 and 13 year life cycles are still unknown. It's part of the magic in what we call Magi Cicada. And uh, scientists have spent entire careers and continue to try to discover what this very curious and unique situation is. I want to talk a little bit about a phenomenon we saw here uh, throughout Maryland, certainly here in Columbia, where I live. In 2017, we had a substantial emergence of cicadas, which were basically off cycle with the ones that were going to emerge in 2021. We also saw a few last year. When cicadas emerge off cycle from the major part of their brood, whether it's early or late, we call those stragglers. Stragglers usually appear in four year intervals, either before or after the major part of the brood. It is just something inherently built in to the populations of these different species of cicadas to be time travelers. Now, we believe that the existing 15 broods probably originated something like this. If we had brood 14 and it made a four-year time jump, it would become brood 10. If they made the four-year time jump, it would become a brood 6. If they made the four-year time jump, it would become brood 2. A single time jump either way would create a brood three or a brood one. And this is the mechanism, or this is the pattern, shall we say, that we believe describes how periodical cicadas evolved into the 15 broods we have this day. I wanna talk a little bit now about synchrony, long life cycles, and prime numbers. Kind of mysterious stuff. Now, I think as all biologists and frankly, uh, non-biologists understand, if you're gonna perpetuate your species, you better be hooking up with potential mates at the same point in time. So for all plants and all organisms on this planet, there has to be synchrony between males and females. The other part of this game that's very important for cicadas to play is this safety and numbers game. In other words, they have to emerge so simultaneously and synchronously that they will fill the bellies of every predator that wants to eat them, and there will still be enough left over to perpetuate the species. So they must appear in very, very narrow windows of time, synchrony. If they should appear one year early, two years late, something like that, the predators will eat them into oblivion. In other words, as Fauci said, if they lower their curve, they simply will not have the massive numbers required to make predators.
predator satiation work. Proof of concept. One of the early cicada researchers decided it would be interesting to try to establish a population of periodical cicadas on the National Mall just outside of the USDA building. So he brought thousands of cicada eggs to the National Mall and released them under some big old trees. And by golly, 17 years later, they emerged right on schedule. However, flocks of birds on the National Mall came and ate those cicadas into oblivion. Nobody reproduced, proving the concept that if you're gonna make it as a cicada, you better be synchronous and you better be bringing everybody to the table. Long life cycle, let's talk about that for a minute. They feed on a tissue in the plant called xylem fluid. Xylem fluid is one of the most nutrient poor tissues in plants. Leaves are nutritious, phloem tissue is nutritious. This simply brings water and minerals up to the canopy of the tree. So we think maybe that poor food source may lengthen their life cycle. You know, long, meager diet's gonna take longer to develop, number one. Number two, it's cold down there, right? Insect development is directly related to temperature. And what that means, if you're living in a thermal sink, basically, geothermal energy, hey, the earth is always cold, maybe that lengthens their lifetime. In the case of periodical cicadas, size matters. Why does size matter? Because in the insect world, the larger you are, the more eggs you can lay, the more eggs you can lay, the better chance you have of that massive emergence. So by growing large, it may simply take you longer to do this. And finally, the mathematical modelers predict that in a world, and a lot of this evolution took place during periods of glaciation and ice ages, that random stochastic events that might extirpate, might annihilate local populations of cicadas were less likely to do so with animals with long lifespans. But here's one theory or one explanation that's my favorite. I'm gonna take you back now, just like my freshman and my underclassmen, Bio 101, nine majors bio course. When we talk about predator prey cycles, you'll remember that prey populations go up, then the predator population goes up, and then the prey decline, and then the predators decline and then the prey go up and the predators go up, and then the prey decline and the predators decline, and then the prey go back up and so on. We call these limit cycles, predator prey cycles. Well, think about this. If you're a periodical cicada and you're emerging every year, the raccoons or the birds, they're just gonna sit around and say, hey man, there's something really tasty coming out in June and July this year, or maybe May and June, but, if you have a 17 year or a 13 year life cycle, what predator can wait 13 or 17 years for a banquet? Not a raccoon, not many birds. So we think this is part of the reason that the life cycle is so long. The other piece of this puzzle, again, proof of concept. Some of you may be familiar with what we call the cicada killer wasp. These particular wasps emerge late in summer and they specialize on dog day cicadas. Why? Because dog day cicadas are dependable. They're going to be there every year. So usually towards the end of June and July, we'll see the cicada killer wasp dinging holes in our lawns. I have several that I keep in my garden just so I can watch these fascinating creatures. After she excavates her gallery, she'll go out on a cicada hunt. She'll fly into the treetops. She'll locate the dog day annual cicadas. After she has stung them and paralyzed them, she will return to her gallery, stuff the cicada down a hole, and then lay an egg on it. Now the cicada is not dead. It is simply paralyzed. It is the undead. 
The female cicada killer wasp has the ultimate in gender control. The female wasp is about twice the size of the male wasp. And if she wants to have a daughter, she will sting and paralyze three cicadas, two or three, and then lay a female egg so they will have enough food. If she wants to have a son, she will only put a single cicada down that hole and lay an unfertilized egg to produce a son. How about that guy? That's pretty clever. I know it took me several tries to get sons and daughters, so that wasp has me beat already all the way across the board. I wanna talk a bit more about prime numbers because these always baffle me. So we can leave it up to the mathematical modelers to help us out. One mathematical model with the assumptions that we have interacting populations of prey and predators and that there are random mutations in prey incubation time, in other words, how long it takes the prey to develop, and we interact that with predators that have random mutations in starvation time. When we run those models, what we find is the predators basically tank in year nine. However, the prey, in this case, the periodical cicadas, are evolving towards prime numbers of something like 13 and 17 years and doing just fine. Well, this is way above my pay grade. So here's another explanation that for me is a little bit more cogent. Now, remember, prime numbers, 13 and 17 years. Suppose in a given area that we had two different kinds of cicadas, let's say two broods, and that one emerges every two years and the other emerges every four years. So every two years, they're emerging together and in interbreeding. If the interbreeding causes hybrids that emerge in one, two, three, and four years as hybrids might, what this does, again, it spreads out the emergence of all cicadas, flattening the curve once again, and foiling that strategy of predator satiation, right? So this is part of the reason we believe that we have prime number long life cycles. And in fact, Periodical cicadas will only emerge simultaneously 13 and 17 year broods every 221 years. The last time this happened was apparently in 1998, and I don't think it's scheduled to happen again until 2219. These guys are mathematical geniuses. Well, people ask, well, how do they know they're underground? How do they keep track of time underground? We don't know for sure. One thing we do know is that plants have annual cycles, right? The cherry blossoms are going to bloom in April usually. The leaves are going to come back on the trees sometime late in April, maybe early May in some cases. So remember I said they fed on that xylem sap? On your deciduous trees, there is no xylem sap going up to the canopy. That is drawn up through the power of transpiration and the evaporative process up in the leaves. So in the winter, those plants are dormant. In other words, there's no intake. But when the buds burst in springtime, now we've got sap flow. So one hypothesis has it that cicadas are simply sitting underground counting those number of seasonal sap flows, one, two, three, 14, 15, 16, 17. Another possibility is they have a yet undiscovered molecular clock. You know, we certainly have diurnal rhythms. I know I wake up at 5.30 every morning. It doesn't matter whether the alarm's going off or not. So we have internal clocks at well. It simply could be, and probably certainly is, that they have molecular clocks. We simply don't know what they are at this point in time. Let's talk a little bit now about some of the things we're seeing and talk a little bit about the life cycle of periodical cicadas. The, this is what's going on right now in, in my backyard and maybe in your backyard too. 
So underneath the trees, they've been underground for again, 17 years, but now they're beginning to build exit galleries, tunnels to the surface of the earth. You'll see these beneath trees. Sometimes they will put a little cap over the top of this. Uh, this is probably likely due to wetter soils or perhaps to deflect rainfall. The, they're called mud turrets. And if you have a stepping stone out in your garden, you can lift up that stepping stone right now and underneath it, you'll see periodical cicadas. If anybody goes to my blog called Bug of the Week, these are exactly the images you will see uh, explaining what the cicadas are up to right now. In a fairly short suspense, when the soil temperatures reach 64 degrees Fahrenheit at the depth of eight inches, that is the signal to the periodical cicada that the world is now warm enough that they can get up out of the ground. They can best their enemies, the predators that are trying to feed on them. They can climb up into the treetops. They can crank up the big boy band. They can attract their mates, they can mate. The females and males can fly and the females can lay eggs in the leaves. So this is a cue that now summer is really here. It's warm enough to do all the things that cicadas have to do. And the densities can be astounding. Out underneath my maple tree, this is one square foot. There are 30 holes in one square foot that's going to translate into 1.3 million cicadas per acre. Now, very soon, in the next few weeks, as daylight wanes, the cicadas are going to make a jailbreak. Remember, they've been living a COVID-like existence for 17 years underground. It's been dark down there. They've been sucking on plant sap. They've been social distancing. They're, wanna, they're gonna wanna get up out of the ground. They're teenagers, go up into the treetop, listen to music, make music, and have some romance. So to kick this thing off, this is what we'll see very soon. And by the way, they do like classical music. Let's give it up for the graduating class of 2021. They made it 17 years they survived underground. Oh my goodness. 
It's a very perilous time in the life of the periodical cicada. It's fraught with danger. Uh, you saw them crossing the streets. Everything on the planet's going to want to try to eat them. Once they make the safety of the tree, and there are going to be bucket loads of cicadas, no question about it. Then they're going to attach to the trunk of the tree, any vertical structure, it could be a tree, it could be the side of your house. If you stand still long enough, it could be you. They're gonna hook on, their exoskeleton is gonna split down the middle, and then using basically hydraulic pressure of their hemolymph by contracting their muscles, they are going to pump themselves up like Hans and Franz. Emerge from that pupil case, that um, nymphal shell actually, they're gonna hang backwards. Then they will grab one with their front legs and expand their wings. And to me, this is the period that cicadas are the most beautiful. I think that's just a gorgeous looking creature. Now, if you're into snacking on cicadas, this is also the best stage to snack on because this is a soft shelled cicada. They're just like soft-shelled crabs. So if you dine on delicacies like cicadas, which I might, that's the stage that uh, really is pretty easy to eat. Okay, we'll play a, a real quick clip, oops, of these things. See if I got a connection here, I do. So this uh, obviously is a time-lapse of the cicada emerging. This will take approximately one hour to accomplish on the night that they emerge, one hour. And then you'll see the wings expand. And by morning time, that cicada will now be hard enough. It will change from this kind of creamy color into the typical adult cicada, which we're accustomed to seeing with the black body, the bright red eyes, and the orange wings. And there are going to be lots of cicadas. Now, they're not feeding on this plant. They've simply emerged. There's probably a big old tree on top of this thing. They came up out of the ground and are emerging, but these are the kind of densities we could expect to see. The adults are gonna live two to four weeks, and they also are gonna sip xylem sap fluid and a little bit extra that's left over will be excreted from their bodies. And you might stand under a tree with many cicadas and it'll be like that old Credence Clearwater Revival song, you might find it raining on a sunny day. Cicadas will make a mad dash to the treetops to find the relative safety. It's very dangerous on the ground and very dangerous uh, to hang around on tree trunks. So up to the canopy they'll go. I often get a question about, are there blue-eyed cicadas? And if I find one, do I get a reward? The answer is yes, there are blue-eyed cicadas. And yes, you will get a reward. Your reward will be having found a blue-eyed cicada. I see these all the time. I doubt that they're one in a million. Uh, I probably have seen a million cicadas, but hey, <laughs> I see blue-eyed or variation in eye color from vermilion to kind of orange to blue every time uh, cicadas are out. Now let's talk about how they make their sound. Uh, it's only the males that sing. They make a call that's distinct to their species. So remember, there are gonna be three species emerging. Those calls are unique for each different species. The organ that they use to make the sound is called a timbal organ. So the male cicada has a drumhead-like organ on the side of its abdomen. There are muscles attached to it and it can vibrate that drumhead to create sound. Its abdomen is hollow and it acts like a reverberation chamber to amplify that sound. So when they're in the treetops, they're gonna hit 80 to 100 decibels, the sound of a jet aircraft going overhead or a lawnmower. So let's have a listen and see what that sounds like.
And don't worry, gang, no cicadas were harmed in the making of this presentation. Now, there are unique sets of calls that each one's do. What you just heard was the alarm call. So if a bird or a bug geek grabs a cicada, that's the noise they're gonna make. They also have the calling song, and the calling song is the one they use to assemble all the members of the same species together in the same place. So a calling song might sound like this. And once they get together in the same place and the males and the females are eyeball to eyeball, the male is going to use his courtship song to try to convince that special someone that she should be the mother of his nymphs. So this is what the courtship song is going to sound like. Well, that certainly does it for me. Um, if she likes his performance, what she's going to do is signify that he's pretty cool. She's going to give a little click of her wings, flick her wings to make a little clicking noise. They're going to hook up and mate. And uh, that's basically the courtship ritual of periodical cicadas. Now, the female, of course, has a... Uh, and ear, both males and females can hear sound. Uh, that particular organ is called the tympanum. And uh, much like our eardrum, uh, it allows the female and the male to communicate together. So they will hook up, you'll often see cicadas. And we need some romantic music for this, of course. They will stay coupled like this for relatively long periods of time. You'll see them uh, courting and mating in the wild this year. The male's a little camera shy once the paparazzi arrive, so I guess I can't really blame him for that. We can tell the males from the females. The male will have a rounded abdomen. The female will have a pointed abdomen that houses the appendage she's going to use to insert eggs into the branches of trees. She will then take this appendage, it's called an ovipositor or an egg laying tube, and she will begin to cut slits in the bark of trees, little twigs about the size of my pinky. Then she will insert her ovipositor and force eggs into the tree. So you can see her abdomen pulsing here. What she's doing is, is shooting eggs down that ovipositor into these egg nests. There can be 20 to 30 eggs in every individual egg nest, and she can lay 400 to 600 eggs during the course of her lifetime. Those eggs are gonna mature in about six to 10 weeks. So usually sometime in July, those eggs will begin to hatch and the tiny cicada nymphs will tumble from 80 feet in the treetop down to the earth. They will bounce twice and then burrow in and begin to feed on roots of plants and begin that subterranean life again for 13 or 17 years underground. It's not on all, at all unusual to see immature periodical cicadas in my gardens. When I work in my flower beds or plant trees, I very often find periodical cicada nymphs in various stages of development underground where they're sipping on plant sap. When will we see cicadas? This data was collected last year by some of the stragglers, the early emergers, through a citizen science project I'll talk to you about called Cicada Safari. Here in the DMV in Delaware, excuse me, um, the District, Maryland, and Virginia, 
The very first cicada last year came out of the ground on day 110, that was April 19th. The very last one on June 14th. These are extreme outliers. The bulk of cicadas emerged right around day 148, which I believe is something like May 28th. So during this window between about day 135 and day 160 is when we will see the great bulk of billions of cicadas, if not trillions emerging uh, in our particular region. Okay, so that's when we can expect cicadas to show up in force. Mid-May to, mid to early June will be the peak emergence time. If this year is like last year was, that's what we expect to see. I want to talk a little bit more now about some of these strategies for survival that we see in periodical cicadas. I talked about the fact that the dog days, uh, the non-periodicals or annuals, have this coloration that can fly really fast. These guys, eh, not so much. Um, they've been described as poor defenseless species. Never seen animals more entirely stupid than the 17-year locust. They make no effort to escape. They're predator foolhardy. Well, I was curious about this because I've tried to catch these from time to time and they really do have some defenses. What I found is that many of them you can simply catch. It doesn't matter whether it's sunny, cloudy, warm or cool. However, some of them will drop from the plant. This is pretty standard for insects. If you try to catch a bug off in time, it will drop from the plant and play dead or they can fly. But these behaviors are temperature dependent. So when it's chilly, 13 degrees, you know, down in the 50s uh, Fahrenheit, they simply, it's too cold for them to fly and they drop off the plant. But as the temperature begins to climb into the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, an uh, ever greater proportion of the cicadas no longer drop when they're attacked, they simply fly. So they're not really defenseless. And there's a direct relationship by the, uh, between the proportion that are flight capable and the temperature. So the warmer it is, the more they can escape or will use the uh, flight defense. Now, it's a hard knock life for cicadas out there. I've already alluded to this a little bit. So birds are gonna love to eat these things. Other predators like invertebrate predators that first night is awful when they're trying to molt and become adults. These are carpenter ants, so the carnage on the trunks of trees and underneath will be amazing as the inverts and vertebrate predators find these things at nighttime. But perhaps the most fascinating enemy of the periodical cicada is a fungus called Massospora. Here you see the abdomen of a male cicada that's been infected by Massospora and it's turned its abdomen into a fungus garden, in other words, a fruiting body. Massospora lays in wait on the surface of the earth for 17 years. When the periodical cicada nymph emerges, Massospora jumps onto its exoskeleton. It then will penetrate the body of the cicada, ultimately producing a fruiting body, which drops spores back to the soil to overwinter. But intervening, here's what happens. The male cicada, even though his genitalia are gone, he will still walk through the landscape. He will attempt to mate with female cicadas and in so doing transmit the Massospora fungus. And now Massospora becomes a sexually transmitted disease in the cicada population. Even more bizarre is the ability of Massospora to take over mind control of the male cicada. It makes the male cicada turn into a little bit of a zombie. Remember before I talked about the male singing and the female liking the performance and flicking her wings? What Massospora does is it causes the male cicada to flick his wings. 
Other male cicadas will then attempt to mate with the infected male cicada, further transmitting and spreading massospora through the population of cicadas. Now that's pretty clever for a fungus. Everything is gonna to wanna to eat cicadas. Uh, my current episode of the Bug of the Week, I've got a picture of a fox that's been excavating my backyard, my side yard, my neighbor's yard, digging up cicada grubs and eating them. Raccoons eat cicadas, turtles eat cicadas, squirrels eat cicadas, birds eat cicadas, fish eat cicadas. Everything wants to eat cicadas. Cicadas are masters of transferring energy and material up and down food webs. For 17 or 13 years, they take from the plant, then they come up and they're going to give back to all the creatures that eat them. So it's kind of a circle of life. It's a give and take situation. The final act of contrition, of course, is when they die. Their little bodies are going to rain back down on the ground in vast numbers. As they decay beneath the trees, the nutrients are going to be released and they're going to fertilize the very plants from which they were spawned and other plants in the area. In addition to that, the holes that they emerge from are going to go down 12 to 18 inches and they're going to last there for two years perhaps. As many as 30 holes per square foot allowing water infiltration that can penetrate the ground and help those plants grow. It's actually been demonstrated that years following the cicada emergence that plants will put on unusually large amounts of growth. Whoops, sorry about that. Again, invertebrate predators like ants are going to have a feast. Populations of birds are going to increase the year of the cicada. They will fledge more young and some may even double clutch. Here's the downside of the story, gang. Remember I said that females were gonna lay eggs in the treetops? Yep. Well, if densities are high, some of those branches are actually going to bend down. We call it flagging. Now what we know, what the scientific evidence tells us is mature, well-established trees are gonna get through this just fine. There'll be no long lasting effect. Those branches will heal. There'll be no reduction in radial growth of the tree or survival. The ones we have to be concerned with are young trees. This is the damage they can cause on recently transplanted trees. This is gonna be fine, not so much. I've had growers of nursery trees that said they planted small trees like this in their fields the year before the cicadas and the cicadas wiped out entire blocks and rows of trees with their overposition damage. This is going to be the favored kind of a tree in terms of its habit. Very long branches, lots of space for cicadas to lay their eggs. Look at this locust tree back here. Hardly any damage on this tree, tons of damage on this tree. The branches will wither, they'll break, they'll fall off. What can you do? Well, some people said, well, you can wrap them in netting or cheesecloth. We'll talk about that. You can wrap bands of sticky stuff. I don't think so. You can interrupt some of the cicadas that are climbing up. But remember, once they're in the treetops, the big boy bin is going to be over here. And after they mate, they're going to fly around and the females are going to lay eggs in many different trees. So they could return to the very tree you got the band on. Remember, it's the females, the flighted females that are laying the eggs. So I don't know about that. What we don't want people to do is even though cicadas are on the label, don't spray them with pesticides, okay? That's not going to be good for the cicadas. It's also not going to be good for the other beneficial organisms, the predators, parasites, birds, and the environment. Several studies have demonstrated that if we put trees in netting with a mesh size of one centimeter or less, we can get almost perfect protection from these, this, these egg scars from the ovipositing cicadas. This was a study done in a fruit orchard. However, if the mesh size gets too big, 2.5 to 5 centimeters, the cicadas can get through. And this was even better 
than multiple applications of organophosphate and synthetic um, pyrethroid insecticides. These are very toxic compounds. They didn't do nearly as well as netting. I repeated this experiment in 2006 and found exactly the same re result. Uh, neonicotinoid insecticides applied to the ground didn't give us nearly as good protection as the uh, cicada netting. So this is what we're recommending. Now, again, this is, an, a per, this is a personal choice. I would say if you were planning on planting trees this spring, put it off till fall. That way you can avoid the damage. The first question you should always ask, of course, is did we have cicadas in 2004? If there were no cicadas in 2004, you probably don't have to worry. If you had them in 2004, you might want to consider delaying planting or netting your trees. We have a video showing you how to net trees at our Cicada Crew website. It's six minutes. It shows you how to make a net and put it on. You can buy these in the store. Other things that will happen is your pets are going to love these. Let the cats play with them, snack on a few. Do not let the golden retriever eat buckets of these things. The exoskeletons are hard to digest, and you know dogs. Don't let them eat too many. They could get a little bit jammed up. If you have swimming pools or ponds, you can cover them with netting, or you can simply skim off the cicadas every day. Eat some if you like. Uh, I certainly will be eating cicadas. Um, I had the opportunity, uh, somehow some Today Show producers that I was working with um, on a story, Jay Leno's producers saw the, the outtakes on the editing floor and they said, they called me up and they said, hey Mike, how would you like to come and see if Jay Leno will join you eating cicadas? And I said, well, how can I resist that? And uh, so I smuggled a couple dozen on my carry-on on Southwest. I got out to California and uh, we had them very nicely prepared. They were on little skewers. We had about six cicadas that were roasted and seasoned on a little skewer. The producer told me to offer one to Jay, but to be sure to offer one to the other guests. It turned out the other guest that night was Russell Crowe, who had just completed the Superman movie. So it came to the point where I played the scientist and I've described the life of cicadas much the same way I've done with you this evening. And then Jay said to me, he said, well, Professor Raup, do, does anything eat a cicada? And I said, sure, Jay, people eat cicadas. And I said, look at this. And I said, here are some cicadas. And I popped one in my mouth and said, mmm, buttery texture, delicious nutty flavor. And then I turned to offer Jay a cicada. And now Russell Crowe was kind of sitting behind me and he whispered to me, he said, I'm not gonna eat that, mate. I said, okay. So I said, Jay, I'll give you a dollar if you eat a cicada. He took one off, he popped it in his mouth and he said, hmm, these are better than Cheetos. And then he took the skewer and he pointed it towards Russell Crowe and he said, Superman's father, like this. You know, he's putting a beat down. And Russell Crowe says, no thanks, mate. There are no cicadas on Krypton. No cicadas on Krypton makes perfect sense to me. So if you want to eat some, okay, there's some fantastic recipes for this thing. Now, some people are not going to like cicadas. Um, for these folks, I say, learn as much as you can right now about cicadas. They don't bite, they don't sting, they don't carry away dogs and small children like the monkeys and the Wizard of Oz. That's not gonna happen. They may give you a little poke if you're thirsty. It's not gonna break this skin. They're just kind of big and rambunctious. People say, oh, they fly and they're flying at me. No, they're just trying to get to the party up in the treetop and they're not clever flyers. So they're gonna land on you and just say hi and then you can throw them up in the air and they'll take off. If it still bothers you after learning about this, I'd recommend seeking some counseling. You might want to talk to you know, a counselor about these and try to understand what is making you concerned about these. That's always good advice. And frankly, if you can't stand it, just go to Ocean City. No cicadas in Bethany. No cicadas in Ocean City. No cicadas in upstate New York. No cicadas in Florida or in California. Get out of town. I've had several people that have now planned their early summer vacation to avoid cicadas. 
If you want to participate in a great citizen science project, download the free Cicada Safari app. It's free for iPhone and Android. This is going to provide us with the data about where cicadas are and are not. And that data I showed you earlier about when cicadas were emerging, that's where I got that data from. It's going to be great fun. Make the download, go out and hunt cicadas. More information, go to our Cicada Crew UMD website, just any browser, Cicada Crew UMD. We have FAQs, frequently asked questions. We have image galleries, resources, links. The Cicadalicious Cookbook, a bestseller is on there if you want to eat cicadas. And the graduate students are selling cicada shirts, shirts with pictures of cicadas. They use this to help fund their graduate programs. Cicada Mania is the source of all things Cicada. Great website. University of Connecticut has a wonderful research. And if you're an educator with school children, go to Friend to Cicadas. This is a partnership between the Audubon Naturalist Society and GW University. Great website, great resources. So with that, alumni, thanks for inviting me to the Cicada. It's going to be fantastic. Go out there and enjoy it. Happens a few times in your lifetime, nowhere else in the universe except right here in the Eastern United States for 13 and 17 year cicadas. So. Thanks, Mike. That I learned more tonight than I ever knew about cicadas. I don't know if I'm excited or yeah. <laughs> doubt. I have no You're idea. We have a couple questions in the chat. Sure. So um, Tamara asked um, early on in the in the um, program, she was asking if there's anything she can do to make her front door less inviting. They, they tend to flock there every summer and they leave exoskeletons on the door frame. Yeah, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't please. Know, I, don't, I know, please. I don't know anything you can do because really they're underground right now. How could you interrupt cicadas? A better I'm day? deathly afraid of these. I'm, yes. I'm afraid of all bugs. I oh, really am. Okay. All me, bugs. Me too. They terrify me. Yeah, right. Well, so I eat them. So I eat them. <laughs> no way. Uh, yeah. Um, I really don't, I don't have a good solution. You could, you could try maybe putting, um, if, you, if you had a potted tree or something like that, another vertical structure, they must be coming out of a flower bed or something, no? Where are they coming I, from? I don't know, I live in Cape St. Clair, which is very near the Bay Bridge. I'm four miles from the Bay Bridge and we have them every summer. Yeah, but those, those are, yeah, those, uh, yeah, yeah, you're not gonna, you're, you're over here, right? Is that close to the Bay Bridge? I can't. Yeah, the Bay yeah. Bridge goes yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But you're on the Eastern Shore side, yes? No, 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 I'm on, I'm on Annapolis side. Oh, you're gonna have cicadas. Um, oh, yeah, we have them every year. I don't, yeah, I'm, those, from, I'm from Rhode Island. I grew up in Rhode Island. Yeah. So we don't have bugs like this in New England, or well, at least- and not in Newport, we don't. Not in New no, not in Newport. They're not in Newport. I agree with that. Um, look, I don't know what to tell you. Those are those are the annual cicadas. All I can tell you, again, they're not going to bite or sting. I, I know that you dislike these things. They're a little bit terrifying. But if you can figure out a way, first of all, I don't know. The thing to do, when did you move here? 2004 in August. So they were gone. Oh. Well, were they gone or were they simply not there? I don't know. Ask your neighbor. Know. You may not have them. They're very patchy. Really? Very, yeah, really. I'm not lying to you here. No, I believe you. I actually, had, I, I like you. I was literally, have, I have so much angst. My friend Maria, she's on here. She works at University of Maryland, invited yeah. me. I'm, I'm, only, I, I, I'm only kidding you about that. But no. No, <laughs> I am not kidding you. You may not have them. If you don't have them, your angst goes away. So I hope you are so right. Talk to your neighbors first and find out. There's no reasonable way I can tell you uh, if you do have cicadas, there's no known way that on this planet or any other planet that you can stop them from emerging from the earth. This is going to happen. It's guaranteed. Right. And there's simply no way that you're going to keep them off of vertical structures. It's what they have to do. So um, again, you may, you may be, it may be time. I'm thinking 
Assateague, Chincoteague, Bethany, Ocean City. So that's where I need to go if I yeah. can't make it back no. up to New England. Yeah. Well, sh well Sounds... sure. You could, you, there's not going to be cicadas in Rhode Island this year. <laughs> well, my daughter graduates from Boston University in a couple of weeks. So I'll be going up there in the middle hey. of May. <laughs> hey, extend the trip. All Try it. I already told my principal <laughs> there you I'm go. not doing recess duty. I've told her oh. I cannot. I will. You know, I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking Tamara, we got a trip to the Cape lined up here. Works for the me. No there, you go. Go. there you go. Works. There you go. I'm there you go. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thanks, Tamara. Um, so just a few quick more questions. Um, so has there been any effect on brood size or cicada behavior due to climate change? Yeah, we don't really know the answer to that. Uh, climate change, frankly, uh, the rapidity at which the Earth is warming is really only a phenomenon that took place since the Industrial Revolution. So I don't think we've got enough data at this point in time to be able to say what, what if there has been effect today, what we do know. With many other animals and insects in particular, what climate change means is there will be a progression northward as ranges expand to places further north. We absolutely know this can and will happen with cicadas. At one point in time, most of New York State was under a glacier, right, a mere 20,000 years ago, but they now have periodical cicadas in central New York. So we know they can go north. Number two, there's a hypothesis some of the 17-year cicadas may shorten their lifespan and become 13-year cicadas. And certainly when we have a very warm spring, as we may or may not, they may just emerge a couple weeks earlier than they have historically. So those would be the three, the three things that are reasonably consistent with the existing data that we have to date. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, it looks like we have a cicada, um, a, a young cicada lover there on camera, um, Aubrey and Abby Robinson. <laughs> asked, yeah. I saw Aubrey. She was paying attention. Hey, Aubrey, how you doing? <laughs> they, they're asking, why do the cicadas burrow underground rather than hide in the trees? Oh, that's a great question there. Several of the other relatives of cicadas live a subterranean life. I remember I said these were much like aphids. Many kinds of aphids actually live underground. It's not a bad place to live. Uh, well, for us it would be, but for cicadas it's not, because by living underground you can escape many of the things that would want to eat you. And this is a big problem for little insects, that everything wants to eat insects. So by going underground they probably can escape from many, many of their predators. But they have to return to the world above ground to do the things that adult cicadas do, like, you know, go up into the treetop and have a party and have a little romance yeah, and, why can't and they things like that. Room? So that's why they're underground for part of the time and, uh, and above ground for the rest. And many other insects do have life cycles that are quite similar. Many beetles, for example, live underground feeding on the roots of plants. And then when it's time to come up and feed on flowers and nectar, that's what they do. Great. And then two more questions. Um, this is my personal question. Are they okay. louder? I can't, are they louder at night? Are they louder at a particular time of the day? Yeah, what they'll do is the day warms up. Again, they're calling and their behaviors are temperature dependent. So in the morning hours, it'll be quiet. But as we start to build through the 60s and 70s in, in the daytime, they're going to chorus louder by mid-afternoon and late afternoon when we reach our highest temperatures, that's probably, except if it's, if it's very, very, very hot, then they'll be singing at their very loudest and then it will begin to tail off uh, towards evening. And usually by nightfall, uh, no more cicadas will start to hear katydids. However, on some very warm nights, uh, especially at the peak mating season, uh, we will sometimes hear cicadas calling even into the uh, evening hours. The second Great sound question. you played, the second sound you played wasn't so bad. That was pretty. I liked that. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was relaxing. <laughs> uh, so the last question, um, Kathleen asks, hearing that emergences are, be are beginning already in Maryland, will this move the entire chorusing period up a few weeks for those of us planning trips to see the cicadas. Some people are coming down from Rhode Island to come see them. Yeah, no. 
<clears throat> the cicadas that are showing up now, uh, again, if you go to my Bug of the Week blog, uh, was a, as I was raking in the backyard and tidying up, there were cicadas near the surface of the ground. They, when you disturb the leaves, they get knocked out of their galleries because they're up high. Those cicadas that I've seen pictures of are really not emerging cicadas. They either crawled out of their hole mistakenly or they were disturbed by maybe a fox or something trying to eat them. Uh, the ones I've seen are not developed. They have a di very distinct coloration just before they make the jailbreak and head for the trees. So I think the ones that people are seeing now are not really fully developed. I think these are inadvertent or um, foolish cicadas or something if they're up out of the ground now. I, I doubt that we're going to see any particular shift in uh, the emergence time. It's going to be a very safe bet that if people come down, let's say from May 14th till the first week in June, they are going to see lots and lots of cicadas. I don't think anybody needs to change a plan. There will be some that are out early, like I said. Uh, today's, I think, the 12th uh, the first one last year was out on the 19th, one, one week from today. So there'll be just very rare ones out. That was one out of thousands that came out. So I think, you know, keep your powder dry. Uh, it's going to, it's going to happen in the middle to the end of the month rather than early. Some will be out early. And again, down in DC and a little further south where it is warmer than up in um, Hunt Valley or somewhere like that, Oregon Ridge Park. Um, I think they'll, uh, they'll be out first down in the urban heat islands like uh, Chevy Chase and Bethesda. So they'll be a week ahead. You'll have fair warning. When you start hearing reports of cicadas in University Park and Chevy Chase and Bethesda, know that your cicadas are probably coming if you're living up in Baltimore uh, a week or so later or here in Columbia. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. You're welcome. Um, this was very informative. Um, I'm, I'm now, I think, looking forward to the cicadas um, in a weird way. I'm still interested on how to prepare them, but we'll put links in the emails. Everyone okay. will, <laughs> everyone will have links to Mike's website. Um, thank you to the Prince George's County Alumni Network for putting this, this uh, event together and just stay tuned for more Alumni Association uh, virtual events and, you know, we'll see each other real soon. Mike, good luck with everything. Thank you. Press thanks so everything. much for having yeah. me and thanks, thanks for, for coming. Thanks yeah, for letting me in your homes this evening. <laughs> Thank you. Bye -bye. Good luck. Enjoy cicadas. It'll be thanks. fun. Thanks, yeah. Mike. Thanks. All right. Go You're Terps. <laughs> Go Good Terps. Go. You got it. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Kara. See you guys. <laughs> All right.